Our scripture reading this morning will come from 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. 1 John 2, 28 and 29. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I'm glad to see all of you here today and hope you're doing well. I want you to, if you would please, have your Bibles open there to 1 John chapter 2. And we'll take the primary part of our lesson out of that passage. It's good to be here with you today. and Visitors, we're certainly thankful that you are here. And uh, if you have any questions about anything that you see while you're here or anything that you hear from this pulpit, don't hesitate to ask. We'll be more than happy to talk with you and answer any question that you may have from the Bible. It's exciting to get back to more normal today and move forward. It's been two years, and that two years is, well, looking at it now, it's gone by quickly, hasn't it? But it's been long enough, and so it's good to see that, and I appreciate so much our elders in all that they've done in helping us and um, well, guiding us through some very challenging times. I have a card here that I didn't get to our announcer, so I'll go ahead and read that. Um, Dear church family, thank you for the lovely shower for Will and me. We appreciate all the gifts, funds, and love you gave us as we start this new chapter of our lives together. In Christian love, Wilson Teague and Emma Ragsdale. So. I know that they are very appreciative of what you all did for them. And let's keep Wilson and Emma in our prayers as they start their life together soon. We've been dealing with this subject of things that we can know. And there's so much uncertainty that, that people feel, I would say, at times in Christianity. Uh, well, maybe not. That's, maybe that's not right, the right way to say it. Maybe it's the idea that people are uncertain within themselves, let's say, as they're trying to live the Christian life. You know, what does it mean to be faithful? Can I know that I'm going to heaven? Can I know the truth? All these different things. And we're working our way through 1 John, answering all these questions. And today, and from our scripture reading that Monty had for us, there's something that we can know. And listen, if scripture tells you you can know it, you can know it. And that is that we can know that we are righteous. Righteousness is quite interesting. And I'm speaking it to you from my perspective in writing and Delivering lectures over the years and listening to lectures, righteousness within the religious realm has been almost turned into a mystery. You know, there are some religious groups that say the only way that you can be righteous is if God imparts that to you. That God has to impute, they use that word impute from Romans chapter 4, righteousness. You can't do it yourself, in other words. Be because a lot of people believe in the religious world that when you're born, you're born sinful, you have a sinful nature... You're dead in sins, and since you're dead, you can't do anything. And that if you're going to be righteous, God has to do that for you. That is absolutely wrong. That is not taught anywhere in Scripture. Now, we can take one verse from one chapter and pull it out of its context. You can do that with any subject and make it say something that it's not saying. But Scripture tells us, number one, that we can be righteous, and number two, that we can know that we are righteous. So then the question becomes, well, what does that mean, okay? Okay. That's kind of a, you know, typically that's a word. We don't use that in our everyday conversations, I would say. But it's a biblical term and one that we need to understand. What does it mean? So this is a bit lengthy, but you know I like definitions. So let's look at this. Righteousness. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, righteousness is the state commanded by God and standing the test of his judgment. So let's stop right there for just a second, okay? If it's commanded by God, and it is, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, then it must be attainable. God doesn't command us to do something that we cannot do. And so if he's commanding people, again, both under the Old Testament and under the New Testament, which would include us, to be righteous, then we must be able to be righteous. It is, and, and this is, I guess I kind of want to highlight this part here. Remember this point right here. It, righteousness, it is conformity to all that he commands or appoints. 
You conform yourself to God's standard of righteousness. That's what it means. If you take anything away from that definition, take that right there. It is conformity to all that he commands or appoints. Since God himself is the standard of the believers, the righteousness of God means the righteousness which belongs to God. Okay, like he sets the standard. If you want to be righteous, you be like God. Or to oneself from God or God-like righteousness. Look, there's nothing mysterious about that, is there? Again, that's not a word that we use typically in our everyday conversations, but it is a biblical term and it is a command from God that we be righteous even as he is righteous. We're to be holy even as he is holy. 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16 tells us that. But that's it right there. It is conformity to all that he commands or appoints. One way that I've looked at it before is if you want to understand what it means to be righteous, just take off the E-O-U-S and it means to be right. We can know that we are right. And what I mean by that is right with God. That's what it means to be righteous because I'm conforming, conforming myself to what he commands. I'm living like he would have me to live and that thus means I'm righteous. So let's think about what Jesus taught about righteousness and then we'll get to 1 John. So take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And this is so interesting because this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is like Jesus's, how would you say it? So chapter 3 is his baptism. This is kind of like his uh, full-blown earthly ministry put on display. This is his first major, so far as we have recorded, public sermon. He's speaking to the multitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. So not everybody in that multitude is one of his disciples. Now, many of them were probably John's disciples. And, you know, that John's disciples, they've been waiting for the Messiah, haven't they? And that's what John's been talking about. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, the Lord's here and his way has been prepared. So what does he tell this multitude? For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he puts on the crowd the responsibility of having a certain um, level, let's say, of righteousness. And it needs to be better than what the scribes and Pharisees do. And so then he, he, he lays that out, what that looks like in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And you know what it all comes down to, the way the Sermon on the Mount closes? What does the wise man do? He hears and, say, he hears and does what I, says, what I say, what Jesus says. That means you build your house on the rock. You hear and do. So Matthew 5, 20, your righteousness needs to exceed that of these other people. Guys, we can be righteous. It's not impossible. We can be what God expects us to be. All right, let's turn over to Matthew 23 and verse 28 real quick. This is the chapter, and I think Kevin's been going through some of this kind of stuff in Bible class, but the, the woes of the Pharisees or against the Pharisees here in Matthew chapter 23 Verse 28, even so ye, talking to the Pharisees and scribes, outwardly appear righteous unto men. So they've, they've got the form down, okay? Remember, they've got the right clothing. Remember, they've got the, um, what is it? Back in verse, uh, in the earlier verses of this chapter, they look right. They've got the proper attire. They, they say things in certain contexts to let everybody know that they're, you know, a little bit better than everybody else. They like all the fancy greetings in the marketplaces. And so they appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So it's possible for us to do that very same thing, isn't it? For, for us to claim to be a Christian and, hey, we come to church on Sunday, but then what does our life throughout the rest of the week say about our righteousness? We could be truly righteous or we could be full of dead men's bones and hypocrisy. Matthew 25 and verse 37. And this, this particular context really tells us, again, what it means to be righteous. Matthew 25 is the picture of the judgment scene in, in three different frames, you might say. Matthew 25, 37 says, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And we know that context. Well, as, as much as you did all these things to some of these other folks, You've done it unto me. That's what it means to be righteous. You live like Jesus lived. And there's no mystery behind that. 
So one more passage, and then we'll get back to 1 John, uh, Luke chapter 18. And this, kind of goes, this one here kind of goes along with the Matthew 23 uh, rebuke of the Pharisees. This is the account of, as you keep reading from verse 9, the two men that went up into the temple to pray. But look at Matthew, uh, Luke 18, 9. He spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This is what we call self-righteous people, self-righteousness. You are your own standard of what is right and wrong. No, you are not, and neither am I. God is the standard of what's right and wrong. And so you start reading there in verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and the one's a Pharisee. Well, guess, guess what he is? He's the self-righteous one. He set his own standard, and it's certainly not God's word. So there, there's a couple of possibilities here. Matthew 5, 20 and... Matthew 25, 37, you can be righteous by doing what God requires. Option two, Matthew 23, uh, 28, and Luke 18, 9, you can be self-righteous. You can be a hypocrite. And that decision's in your hands. Nobody can make those decisions for you. So let's go back to 1 John. This word righteous or righteousness appears a couple of times in 1 John. And we're going to start out in chapter 2 and verse 1 because, again, here's the standard set out for us. 1 John 2 and verse 1, notice what the text says. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, or the righteous one. That's what that means. Now, there are two other times where Jesus is called that in Scripture. Um, Acts chapter 3 and verse 18, where Peter is preaching to some Jewish people in the temple, and he says, you murdered the holy and just one. Well, that word just, it's, it's the same word in the Greek. It means the righteous one. And then 1 Peter 3 and verse 18 tells us about Jesus that the just died for the unjust or the righteous one died for the unrighteous ones. That's the same word. Sometimes you'll see that word just in uh, your King James Version. Most of the time it comes from the same word in the original language. Jesus is the standard of righteousness. I am not and neither are you. We have one standard that we are to conform to, and that's just it. Righteousness is conformity to all that God commands. And that's what Jesus did. And frankly, you and I fail at that sometimes, don't we? We all fail at that. Sometimes we don't do what we ought to do. And sometimes we do things and say things that we ought not. But we can still be righteous. Righteousness does not mean sinless perfection. It means that you're right with God. And you can be right with God. You can be walking in the light. And that's what John's dealing with here in 1 John chapters 1 and 2. You can be walking in the light and sin. But you need to correct that to stay in the light. But as you're walking in the light and you sin, we have the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 and verse 7. We have to confess our sins. 1 John 1 and verse 9. And we're cleansed. But we can be righteous because we know the standard of righteousness. And that's Jesus Christ. All right, secondly, let's look at 1 John 2 and verse 29 again. This is from our scripture reading uh, that Monty read to us. If, we, if ye know that he is righteous, and he's talking about Jesus. Well, you do. You know that Jesus is righteous. Ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now, let me read that to you from the New King James. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is is born of him and that's what it means it's this is a lifestyle you are doing what is right you're conforming yourself to the standard that you find in god's word you're trying to match what jesus did but you notice here the phrase all who do righteousness are born of god and so you know you think about that and I, i'm surely you've heard maybe of yourself you know i, I can see your father in you or your son reminds me so much of, you've heard that kind of a thing, haven't you? Where people recognize a, like a familial trait within you, the way you, maybe the way you say something or the way, you can even see that with like fathers and children or mothers and daughters, the way they walk even. It's a, it's a family trait. Well, if, we're, if we are born again, born of God, there's going to be a familial trait that follows. People will be able to see that. And that's what he's dealing with here. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. That family resemblance is there. You, you think about it. You know, God is our father. 
Hebrews chapter 2, I think it's verse 12. Anyway, it's in Hebrews chapter 2. We're told that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to be called our brother. God's our father and Christ is our brother. And so there ought to be some similarity in the family, don't you think? That's what it means. Jesus is righteous and we have those familial traits, chapter 2 and verse 29. All right. Thirdly, look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. And I love this section here, beginning in verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that de okay, So pick up what he's saying. That don't let people trick you about this, what he's getting ready to say. And there's still people today, 2,000 years later, who try to trick us about this. Because again, they say something about righteousness that like you, you can't do it. God has to give it to you. you. You're dead in sins, and so God's going to have to send the Holy Spirit to change you. That is not anywhere in Scripture. But it's taught. Man, it's taught on a regular basis. I heard, uh, I heard this come from a pulpit within the church a couple of weeks ago. A man was preaching about, and, and that's, the, that's the shame. This guy is a, is a teacher in the church. And he said, the only way that we can overcome our sinful flesh is to get baptized and get the Holy Spirit. Scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture never says that. But, I mean, that's being taught. So what John's saying here is don't let people trick you about this. All right? 1 John 3 and verse 7. Because it's so simple. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. How simple is that? You know, there's no secret to being a Christian. There's no mystery. There's no, there's no riddle or puzzle you've got to solve. This is what it comes down to. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. He that does what's right is right. Even as he is righteous. Okay, that's talking about God himself. Now, you've got the flip side of that in verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now, these are all present tense verbs here. It's not just saying he who sins one time. This is like a lifestyle. So, verse 7, you've got to keep on doing what's right. Verse 8, if you keep on doing what's wrong, if you keep on sinning, you are of the devil. Well, there's going to be that familiar resemblance, isn't there? Just like being born of God. If you act like the devil, you're one of his children. That's what John's saying here. The devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And again, that's a present tense verb. He that is born of God does not continue in the practice of sin. That doesn't mean we never will. And I know you understand that, but I think that's important. Because so many people, they, they set out to live the Christian life. They have good intentions and a good heart. And then they, let's say they came out of a lifestyle of sin, whatever that sin may be. They obey the gospel and then they stumble and fall. And then they're like, well, I just can't do this. I quit. You don't quit. You're going to be tempted and you may stumble and fall. But that's the blessing of being in Christ. When you do stumble and fall, you pray to God about it. And he is righteous to forgive you of what you've committed. Again, that's 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. So anyway, uh, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God does not keep on committing sin, for his seed remains in him. The seed is the word of God. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. We have God's word. It's like the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I've told you this before. Every time Jesus was tempted by the devil, what was his response? Three words. It is written. So the Christian doesn't keep on sinning. Why? Because he knows what God says about sin. And so we're going to avoid that. And he cannot sin. That is, he cannot keep on sinning because he is born of God. And th in this, verse 10, the children of God are made manifest. In other words, it is visible. You can see. It's kind of like Jesus said in Matthew 7. By their fruits you shall know them. That's true, isn't it? it? Their life is going to manifest it. So verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil. You can know who's who, guys. You can know that about yourself. And you can know that about others. Because it's manifest. It's obvious. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So... Our righteousness can be like his, and it's not mysterious. People will try to trick you about it. Verse 7, don't let them. He who does what's right is right, period. All right, next, 
Let's go to 1 John chapter 3 here still, verse 12. This one is so interesting to me. And this is our last point on the screen up here. So, let's, so we just read verse 10. We'll just keep going. Verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. So he pulls an example from the Old Testament. Here's what we are to be, not like this guy back here, who was of the wicked one and slew his brother. Why did he kill him, John asks? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. You go back and you read Genesis chapter 4. And, you know, the scene is Cain and Abel come to worship. Cain brings of the fruit of the ground because he was a tiller of the ground. Abel brings the best of his flock because he was a shepherd. And the Bible says that God accepted um, Abel's offering but did not accept Cain's. And when you read that uh, exchange between God and Cain, you remember Cain becomes very angry. By the way, be turning over to Hebrews chapter 11. Cain becomes very angry, and God looks at him and says, the, the King James says, doest thou well to be angry? In other words, do you have any right to be mad? If you had done what's right, won't you be accepted? Well, yes, of course. And that's what 1 John 3 and verse 12 is saying. He who does what is right is accepted by God. Now look at Hebrews 11, uh, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Notice that the, the sacrifice was more excellent. God, when, when Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices... God didn't decide at that point in time which one he liked and which one he didn't like. They knew ahead of time. And that's why, Cain, uh, that's why Abel could offer his animals by faith. See, God doesn't work. God's not arbitrary. He's got a standard, and we either follow it or we don't. I mean, that's conformity. We conform to it or we don't. So by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Notice this. <clears throat> by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of that. Notice. God testifying of his gift. God bore witness to the fact that what Abel offered was better than Cain's. And by Abel offering what he should, in other words, by doing what he should do, he was righteous. There's no secret there, is there? There's no mystery to figuring that out. If you want to be right with God, you do what God says and that's the end of the story. Being a child of God is not that complicated, is it? It's kind of like, and you know, this is here in 1 John as well. 1 John 5 and verse 3. This is the love that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. There's no, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything special. You just have to do what God says do. And that's what makes you righteous. The rest of Hebrews 11 and verse 4 and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. I don't know how many thousands of years Abel had been dead at this point in time, but he was still speaking in a sense because he set an example that if you want to be righteous, then you just do what God says do. And God bears witness to that fact. He recognizes when we do what's right, but he also recognizes, obviously, when we do what's wrong. Listen, we can know that we're righteous. It's not a mystery. It's, it's kind of like, man, there's so many passages that, that we could talk about. Um, well, one that I think of is Romans, like Romans chapter 1 verses, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, where we are told to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, how do you prove what God's will is? You do that by living it out. You do that by being like Abel and but like those other people in Hebrews chapter 11 <coughs> who by faith did what God told them to do. And that's all that we're called to do. If you want to be right with God, and that means righteous, that's what we're talking about this morning. All you have to do is do what God said. And we have that right here. And see, that's the thing. If you don't know what to do in life as a Christian, maybe you need to get back to this right here. Again, there's no secret here. There's no, uh, <clears throat> there's no mystery about it. 
If you want to be right with God, it's laid out for you. It's kind of like Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's it. So, in closing, I guess, you can know. You can know whether you are right with God or not. Um, your life manifests that. The way that you conduct yourself manifests that on a daily basis. If you're not right with God, that's something that you know. But it can be made right. That's the thing. So you've got, let's say you've got two scenarios. You've got a person who's never become a Christian. The Bible's very clear on that. This is just like righteousness. <clears throat> what it takes to become a Christian is not mysterious and it's certainly not difficult. We're told that if we don't believe in the name of Jesus Christ, we'll die in our sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. We're told that if we don't repent of our sins, we'll die in our sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. We're told that if we don't confess Jesus before men, that he won't confess us before his Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And we're told that if we believe and are baptized, we will be saved. That's not hard. But see, each one of those, and this is what we've been talking about on Sunday nights, if you remember, each one of those things says that they save you. Believing saves you, repenting saves, confession saves, baptism saves. But the, not one of those things alone saves. You're not saved just when you believe. You've got to start there. But there are other things that are required. If you want to be righteous, you've got to do it all, not just a part of it. And so maybe you're here this morning and you have never taken those steps necessary to become a child of God. That's the only way that you can be righteous. It's the only, only way that you can be right with God is conform to his will. If you have questions about that or perhaps you're here this morning and you're ready to do what's necessary and that way, let's do it. Scenario number two is you've obeyed the gospel. You were baptized into Christ and you had your sins washed away. But then as you're walking in the light, you stumble into sin. Again, that's 1 John chapters 1 and 2. What does that passage tell us to do? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not hard, is it? I, I, suppose, the, I suppose the hardest part is getting over our pride and being willing to repent and confess. But we are assured when we do that that God will hear us and forgive us. It's not hard. It's not impossible. And if you're ready to be right with God, let's take care of it right now as we stand and sing.